It's good to see y'all here this morning. If y'all would, let's stand up and worship together. In the darkness, in 
Lord. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt sing praise the father Uh, go ahead and be seated for just a moment. Good morning. Um, wanted to uh, make y'all all aware that this month is October. I know y'all forgot. Um, it's, a, it's a special month. It is Pastor Appreciation Month. So, Josh, will you... Words cannot describe the feelings I have for our pastoral staff here. And um, I hope that these uh, small gifts um, will be thought of as great gifts. So thank you very much for 
what you do. Chris? Chris gets one. Cody, you want me to leave it over here? You want to you hold it in place? Drew, you want it up there? Okay. All right, well, thank you all very much. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. It is an honor to be able to serve as we do and uh, to be able to answer that call uh, in this place. So, again, we just want to welcome you to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church. Uh, those of you that are present with us this morning, those who are watching by the live stream, again, we just are here. Couldn't think of the, the, the verse in Revelation about the after that song about the picture of Christ in Revelation 19 and he, on the white horse. And it's uh, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's that's who we worship today. The one above all, the name above all names is him, is his name. And we just are, are grateful to, to have that blessing uh, to be able to worship him today again. Just to, if you're a guest with us this morning, again, we just are, are glad that you're here again. There's a tab in our bulletin. If you have any information you'd like to share with us or if you have any prayer requests that you'd like to share with us, uh, please uh, put that in the offering plate later on in the service and uh, we'll be, be grateful to receive that from you. Also, again, just want to remind you this afternoon, um, Just uh, we do have deacon ordination service at five o'clock this afternoon right here again for a couple of our guys uh, that are, are newly uh, elected as deacons and uh, we'll have that service at five today so I encourage you as a church family to come out and just show your support uh, for them and for our deacons uh, during this special service okay go ahead if y'all would stand as we continue to worship this morning See him there, the great I am, the crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us.
will bow before the King of Kings. Oh God, forever we will sing. Behold, behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written. Third 
Good morning, Mark McGrove. My name is Mark McCraney. I'm one of your current servant deacons. Pray with me, please. Father God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, we thank you for another day of your grace and your mercy that you so freely give to us each day. Lord, let us always remember the, the price that was paid for that grace and mercy. Lord, let us remember our brothers and sisters down south as they're suffering right now. We know what that was like here. Lord, bless our first responders, our military men around the world. Lord, be this now during our service. Bless our pastor with the words that you have given to him. Lord, bless this gift and the gift that, we're about to re- that you're about to receive. It's your name I pray. Amen. him to remind us about how God's kingdom will last forever and that Jesus is our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Um, We are continuing in a series that I began last week called Thanks Living and we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and we'll look at the first four verses of that chapter uh, this morning. So you can be finding your way there in God's word and I don't often speak on the subject of tithing. It's not one of my favorite subjects to preach on. And I feel like it's a, it's a personal matter. And that's why uh, because it kind of can get kind of personal with people. It touches you right, right where your heart is, in the seat of your pants. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like it, sometimes it, it, it can be overlooked, but at the same time it shouldn't be overemphasized. And so we need, to, uh, we need to touch on this subject because the Bible talks about it and it's part of our, our Christian service as we give, uh, give to the things that God calls us to give to and wants us to give to. My grandmother taught me how to give. And, and I, I could say tithe, but at the same time, I, I wasn't earning anything. She was supplying 
the gift that I gave, but she taught me how to give. Um, we would stay over at my grandmother's house, grandmother and grandfather's house on Saturday nights, and we'd get up early in the morning on Sunday morning and put on our Sunday best and get ready for church. After we had our breakfast, we'd collect our Bibles, and each child would receive an envelope from my grandmother filled with coins. And you've probably seen some of these envelopes before. I, I don't know if you've ever used one before, but we used to have these. Uh, Sunday School Members Report. And it, it's an envelope, and it, you fold it. Um, you put your name and your date and your class and department and the amount of your offering on that for Sunday School. And then you could go by there and check to see how good of a Sunday School student you actually were. You could gauge it just by how many check marks that you got. Because you could, you know, Sunday school attendance, I brought my Bible. Less, I studied my lesson. I'm giving. I'm attending church. after. I'm not leaving after Sunday school. I'm staying for church. And uh, I'm doing my daily reading and prayer. And uh, I went on visits, man. I mean, you're really doing good if you can check all of these. Did my vis- visits. And how many did I do? Well, I made five visits this week, you know. And uh, so I made other contacts, too. I called some folks, and so here's the number of those people that I called. It's just a way to quantify. And listen, folks, we can get caught up in, the, in the, all of the check marks and doing all of these things of Christianity uh, and think that we're doing great by systems such as these. And, and I think that a while back, this was, the, this was the gauge. This was the benchmark that you needed to meet as a Christian. And so, but my grandmother... She would give us these little envelopes and put the money in there for every one of the child, children that stayed at her home, even my cousins, and they were to be deposited in Sunday school during the Sunday school hour. They never, they never contained more than a dollar or so in coins. But it was my grandmother teaching me that giving is part of Christian living. It's a significant part. But here's the truth that I want you to see from God's Word. We give because God is a giving God. You see, He set the pattern of giving long before you and I ever came on the scene. He is a giving God and He's been giving from the very beginning. And so we should develop this pattern of giving. If we call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High God, we should exemplify His character in the way that we give. And one of the greatest verses, and you all know it very well, is John 3.16. What does it say about God? It says, for God so loved the world that He gave. Let's say that again and you say it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave. His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. The summation of the gospel is that God is such a giving God that He did not even withhold His one and only Son, but gave Him freely to us. Now Paul's going to give instructions to this Corinthian church that he's been answering questions that the Corinthian church has raised about Christian living and about how to operate as a church. And in chapter 16, he addresses one of the questions. And one of the questions is about the gifts that were to be given to the saints in Jerusalem to alleviate their suffering. So why don't you stand with me and we'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Paul says to the church, Now concerning... The collection for the saints. As I directed the churches in Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Let us pray together. 
Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that you give so freely to us. Lord, thank you for the gift of your one and only Son, who purchased our salvation on a cruel cross. Such extravagant love, this plate so freely for us, compels us, Lord, to give extravagantly, to be generous in all things, and to recognize, Lord, that it all belongs to you. And we're simply called to give, to be a blessing to others, as you have blessed us. Lord, I pray that you would help us in this, that we would be faithful. Not one of us would be faithless. But God, as we give, we know, Lord, that you will supply. We trust you in these things. Lord, the most important gift that we give is our testimony of how you've changed us and saved us and made us new in Christ. And so, Lord, help us to always give the gospel above and beyond any other gift that we give to anyone who needs to hear it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want, to, I want to share with you just from these four verses, I want to share with you five words to help you establish a pattern of giving in your life. And if you've already established that pattern of giving in your life and you've been a faithful giver uh, to the, the work of the Lord and the work of the church, if you're faithful in that, these words will encourage you in that to continue on. And, and these are reasons for and, and how-tos uh, whenever it comes to giving. These five words. So number one, the first word that I want you to think about is necessity. Necessity. Now, Paul addresses a question or a concern that the church has already raised. And he says, now concerning the collection for the saints. It's obviously an instruction that Paul had left with the Corinthian church. That they were to give to the needs of of the other churches around them, specifically and especially the church in Jerusalem. And now this was a vital ministry of the church because the Corinthian church, a well-established community uh, and have, having prospered as a church, was expected to help a less fortunate church in Jerusalem. If you remember the situation in Jerusalem? Persecution had come. And the church was scattered. And those that were left there were left without means of survival. In many cases, many of them lost their jobs and their incomes because of their faith in Christ. Many of the people that were in Jerusalem stayed there after the day of Pentecost and remained there uh, rather than going back home. They stayed in the church. And so there was a lot of poverty. There was a lot of affliction. There was many, many needs of the church in, that, in, in first century Jerusalem. And the other churches, Paul instructed them to remember the persecuted church in Jerusalem and to give to their needs. And so there was a need. But he also realized that Paul expects that they're all, they, they will all collectively give to the need. So he didn't just tell one church, hey, it's your responsibility to give because you've prospered. No, he tells all of the churches, no matter where their financial status is, that they are supposed to give. And help out as they can and as they should. Because, and here's why, the church in Jerusalem was the very first church that God established. And all of the churches in Asia Minor owed their existence to the church in Jerusalem. They were the sending church. They were the church that God had first filled with His Holy Spirit. They were the church that had first sent out missionaries. They were the first church that established uh, church polity and deacons and leaders. They owed them everything. Now Paul, he, he gets really specific about this in Romans chapter 15. I just want to read it to you. He says, at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. So it was Paul's intention that he wasn't just going to tell the churches to go do this, but he intended himself to go on behalf of these churches to bring back an offering to the saints and lay it at the apostles' feet. Much as was the pattern in Acts chapter 5 where people, when they had proceeds for something that they sold or, or work that they had done, they brought that and laid it at the apostles' feet so that it may be redistributed back out for the work of ministry. Paul intended to do that. 
He says, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to them. Now, why did they owe it? Why was it important for the church to give it? He says, for if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what, was, what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. And so Paul says, I'm coming to check up on all this. Paul says that regularly. We'll get to that later. That's the fifth word. But then he says to the Corinthian church, he says, so you also are to do. It's mandatory. It's not only for Galatia, for the Corinthians as well. The Galatian churches were faithful in, in giving, and Paul used them as an example to the other churches. You know that whenever you give, you encourage other people to give. Whenever they see your example in giving, they're encouraged to give as well. And they're, they're, they're reminded to not think just about themselves, but to think about others as well. The reason that we give is because we are concerned for the needs of others. And the depth of our concern for the well-being of others isn't measured by our emotions or our rhetoric. It's measured in deed and truth. The proof is in the pudding. This is the last thing I want to do as a pastor is get up and tell you, you must give. I don't want to do that. I don't want to compel you to do it. No one has to tell you to put your money where your mouth is. If you say you love God and you truly believe it, you'll be willing to do it on your own. The proof is in the pudding. People give to what they believe in. So if you don't give, what does that say? You don't really believe. You don't really believe in what you say you do. The first word is necessity. It's not only necessary because people have need, it's necessary because you've been compelled by the Spirit of God to do it. But the second word is regularity. Now look at verse 2 and what he says. On the first day of the week, of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Well, just focus on that first part. On the first day of every week. Well, it's a well-established pattern of the first century church that they met together and worshiped together and broke bread together on the first day of the week. Now, many of them still kept a Sabbath day on Saturday, but then they met together to worship on Sunday. Why did they meet on Sunday? And why did eventually the church begin to observe all of their religious observances on Sunday? Well, it was because it was a memorial to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they met together that. So this verse and all everything that Paul says, what it does is it presupposes that we will be faithful church attenders. Maybe think about that for just a minute. Let that sink in. He says, on the first day of every week, bring it together. Bring this collection together. First day of every week. Every week. Not once or twice a year when you come together. Not once a month when you attend. But he says, every week we come together. So it presupposes that we're doing what the writer of Hebrews tells us to do in Hebrews 10.25. He says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. That we're coming together. That we need to be faithful in our attendance just as we are faithful in our giving. Why? Why do we do that? It's because we come together for the explicit purpose of worship. And what Paul is saying is that our giving is in itself an act of worship. You getting that? When we give, it's an act of worship. It is to be an act of worship. 
And that means that we must come with the right heart and the right attitude and come and give it in a heart and attitude of worship. And we don't just just come thinking that we're, we're doing our duty, we're paying our dues for our membership in the church. That this is about your heart aligning with God's heart for the work of the kingdom of God. And therefore, it becomes an act of worship. And if we come with the wrong attitude, God does not receive that offering. Now listen to what he says and what what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 23 through 24. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. Now, he doesn't say take that gift back home with you or put it back in your pocket. Right. You've already decided to give it. And so he says, but you remember. Then he says, first, be reconciled to your brother and then come. And offer your gift. And listen, if you come to church and, and you're angry with your brother or your sister, you have something against them or they have something against you, reconciliation must happen before you come to worship. You go to them. And if you're here and you're sitting in the pew and God puts it on your heart that you need to go to your brother or your sister, as soon as we dismiss, you go straight to that person and you get it right before they leave. You hear me, brother and sister? Don't go home with that in your heart. Or else everything you left at church meant nothing. And here's the... Here's the pattern of regularity that he says. On the first day of each week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up. You know how we do that? We know, you know how we do that at our church. We, we put it in a plate. We take it. It goes into a safe. And then from the safe, it's counted and accounted for. And then it goes into the bank. It's safely deposited in the bank. And this is similar to what Paul is saying, that we're going to set it aside. What that means is to to store it up, to put it somewhere safe and secure. That's what he wants them to do. Put it aside, store it up, as he may prosper. And this is a well-established pattern in the Old Testament. They were told uh, in the book of Leviticus, the Israelites were told to bring it all together, bring the tithe into the storehouse. They were tithing food. And so they literally had a big barn where they put all of the food, all the grain offering that came in and it supplied the the Levites who were not allowed to have land. They couldn't have their own crops. And so in order for Israel's worship to continue, And in order for Israel really to be governed, because the Levites were kind of like that governing class, in order for them to do that, they had to be fed. And so they would bring that to the storehouse. And in Malachi, in chapter 3, Malachi confronts the people of Israel for not bringing the tithe. And he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. We give regularly as a spiritual discipline. The third word that I want you to see, which is related to the regularity, is proportionality. That we give in a proportional way Because of what God has given to us. So if God has blessed us, then we give out of that blessing. Notice what he says next. He says, put put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. The words literally there that Paul uses, it literally means that if you're on a good road, as anyone who is on that good road, in other words, if the Lord has blessed you, he expects you to become a blessing. And let me say this, I said, if the Lord has blessed you, let me say this with absolute clarity. The Lord has blessed you. <laughs> so don't, don't say, well, I'm not that one. That, I'm not that guy. That's somebody else. No, the, the, you are on the good road. You have been blessed. You have prospered. Because the Lord has given you. You know that as we sit here, as you sit here and I stand here in this room, you're among the world's top 3% of income, income earners in the world. 
Let that sink in. 97% of the world lives with less than you do every day. So we've been blessed materially, and therefore we should be a blessing. The gift is at your discretion, though. You know how you've prospered. And in fact, that's what Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira. He says to Ananias, he says, listen, when you sold this property and you pretended to come and bring all of it, but you kept some of it for yourself, when you sold it, before you sold it, was it not your property that you could do whatever you desired to do with it? And then after you sold it, was that money not yours that you... And did you not have discretion to give it however you chose? That's what he says. And then Ananias is doing this for recognition. He's doing this so that people can see him. And he's lying to the Holy Spirit in the process. And what what God is saying to you and me is. This is at our discretion. It's for the Lord to put it on our hearts and for us to be faithful in it. It's not for a pastor to stand up here and say, you must give your tithe. And if you don't tithe, I've known churches, listen, I've known churches would not allow people to serve because they weren't giving enough. I've known that. It's not for me to judge that. It's not for you to judge it. It's for the individual to judge in their own heart. To give as they have prospered. I don't know how much you make. And I don't want to know how much you make. That's not for me to know. There is no New Testament. Before I'm going to say this again. I know that as I say this. Some of you are not going to like it. But I'm going to say it anyway. Because it's the truth. There is no New Testament command to tithe. Okay? It is not in the New Testament for you to tithe. It doesn't say that. You don't believe me? Let me quote one of, one of uh, today's leading theologians and preachers. This is Alistair Begg. Listen to what he says. The New Testament does not lay down the principle of the tithe. But listen to the second part. But neither does it set it aside. It is therefore not unreasonable to assume that it presupposes that our giving will more than equal to the standard pattern under the old covenant. So I want you to get what he's saying. He's saying even though the New Testament does not command the tithe, it presupposes that we're going to give the tithe and then give above and beyond the tithe. That's what the New Testament presupposes. Still, some have elevated tithing to the position that if you come, but don't tithe, you're considered a second class member of the church. Or that churches have become little more than a country club where members pay their dues in order to have their piece of the pie. And listen, folks, if you elevate the tithe to that highest place in your Christian duty, but you neglect the service that God has called you to, Jesus calls you a hypocrite. Let me tell you what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you tithe, mint, and dill, and cook. I mean, can you imagine the scribes and the Pharisees? I mean, I, I imagine that little, that little canister of cumin that I have at my house. And those tiny little grains of ground cumin. Pinching it out. Well, that's the Lord's. Imagine how absurd that is. But folks, we do the same thing. Listen to what Jesus goes on and says. He says... For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. 
when we count it down to the penny and we give it with a little bit of a grudge, and then we turn and walk away and feel like we've done our duty and our religious service to God, and we're kind of gruff to the folks on the way out, and we just speed to Sonny's and bump the Methodists out of the way so we can get in line. <laughs> what have we forgotten? We have forgotten the weightier portions of the law. Can you imagine Jesus saying to the man who was demon-possessed, he was living out among the tombs, and he, he, he's saying to this man, and he, the demon is in him, and not, not one demon, but many demons. Now, here's what I want you to do. Go to the synagogue and present your tithe. And you will be healed. Surely not. Jesus heals the man. Cast that demon out of him. And then commands him to go to his kindred and tell them how much the Lord had done for him. Never said anything about tithing. And somehow, somehow we've created a litmus test for good church membership by looking at whether or not we've tithed. You know, God loves a person who can give nothing materially just as much as He loves the person. That can give abundantly. And it doesn't even hurt them. So no, the New Testament doesn't command the tithe. But if it does anything, it commands us to be extravagant. In everything that we have to the Lord. Not, not, not just the money and not just the mint and dill and the cumin. But in all things. We give it all. Listen, it's not good stewardship to simply give a tithe to the Lord. It's not that the tithe belongs to the Lord and the other nine tenths belong to you. The tithe is meant to remind you that it all belongs to Him. Giving a tithe helps you learn to spend the other nine tenths the way the Lord would want you to. And so we give it proportionally, but we also realize that He wants all of us, not just the tithe. And when we give, the fourth word that I want us to think about is priority. To make a priority out of our giving. To make sure that we do it intentionally. Listen, because if you, if you put it off, and you say, I'll do it later. Guess what? You won't do it. It's got to be regular. When you put your budget together, you need to plan. Now notice what Paul says in verse 2, the end of verse 2. He says, store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. And what Paul says is, you need to make it a priority while I'm not there so that you can focus on the real priority while I am there. You see, the church didn't have a regular pastor that was preaching at this point. Imagine if they had, Paul would not have needed to write a scathing letter like, letter like 1 Corinthians to the church. They're having a hard time getting it together as a church. And what Paul is saying is, listen, I want you to make this the priority. I want you to deal with it ahead of time so that whenever I arrive, we can focus on the gospel and we can focus on the preaching and the teaching. And so while I'm there, I won't have to worry about taking up a collection. It will already be done. And what that reminds me of is whenever you set your budget at home, if you're not on a budget, work on that, okay? Now, we budget, but we don't do it perfectly. I have a budget. We're not perfect. Nobody's perfect at it. But if you don't have a budget, I encourage you. Maybe this is one of the takeaways that you go home from this sermon and you say, okay, I'm going to get on a budget. I'm going to do that. But at the top of that budget... We have where we're going to give, how much we're going to give at the top of that budget. And it's important for us to do that, to make it a priority. 
So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. I remember when Allison and I first got married, we were living in a little shack of a house, a shotgun house is what I call it, in Sunrise, Mississippi. I've shown the picture before. It was ugly blue, faded blue. The porch was crooked. The walls were crooked and had holes in them where you could see daylight and and the ceiling, part of the ceiling went this way and the other went this way. And, you know, the floor, you could put something on the outside of the wall, uh, like Taylor's little toys, and they would roll to the inside of the wall. It was built on cypress stumps and there were holes in the bathroom floor and we could see the dogs and the cats chasing each other underneath the house while we were taking care of business in the bathroom. And that month, a few unexpected expenses, it caused us to be a little short. There was too much month at the end of our money. But we had determined we, that we were going to tithe. That it, it was a priority, priority of ours. Now, we just had that burden on our heart that we were going to give. We decided. And we believed that God would take care of our bills. We had a bill that was $180. And we couldn't pay that if we paid our tithe. But on Sunday, we put the money in the offering plate. That following Monday there was a check for $180 in the mail to cover that bill and not a single soul knew the predicament that we were in God just saw fit to bless us in that now we've grown since then and what we realize now is we need to budget better <laughs> and not depend on a check in the mail <laughs> that may or may not come. Paul didn't want this church to put this off. If you're not in the habit of giving, begin giving today. Make it a priority. The last word that I want you to see from the text in verses 3 and 4 is, is kind of, it's kind of, Paul pulling the curtain back just a little bit for us to see the inner workings of the church. And he says in verses 3 and 4, And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. See, what he has done is he's tasked with the church, the Corinthians, with selecting specific people that were trustworthy in the church to handle giving, to, to take the collection up, to account for it, and then deliver it Safely to Jerusalem. And this is so important for the church. I mean, here's the deal. You don't want to give to anything you can't trust, do you? You want to make sure that you can trust it. And that's why it's, in, it's so important for us as a church to ensure accountability. That's why two people or more always handle the money in the church. And that's why we make sure that those people that are handling the money are trustworthy people. And they've proven that. And then Paul even himself, listen to what he says in verse 4. And if it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. But I think about that. I think about how Paul is even submitting himself to the church and saying, look, if it's advisable, meaning that if the council comes together and they decide that I should go, then I will go. Paul submitted to the council of the church as to his own participation in the matter. We all come collectively. And this is, this is such a big point here. And I want to I say this, and I will say it as clearly as I possibly can. The local church absolutely matters when it comes to your giving. I've known people that say, well, I tithe, but I... I tithe to this ministry or that ministry, or I send my money into that radio ministry, and that's where my tithe goes. Folks, that is an unbiblical way to give your money. Now, if you want to give above and beyond after you've given to the needs of the local church, and you want to give above and beyond that, then that's at your discretion. 
But you give first and foremost with no strings attached to the work of the local church. And what that says is you believe what God has said about His church. That God says His church is His body, His hands and feet here on this earth to do the work of ministry, the building of the kingdom of God. That this is the place where it happens. And I pray that you believe in the church that way. And I pray that you understand that what we do with the money collectively, as we are accountable to one another, that we are building the kingdom of God. We give trusting the Lord will use the gift for his kingdom. That's such an important point. I, I don't want to overemphasize that, but at the same time, I want you to understand my heart about this. When we do our budget, we, we set aside a tithe, and it goes directly to the church. Then whenever we do the rest of our giving, we've picked out several ministries, and we give directly to those. Amen. As God has allowed us to do that. And folks, that's the way we should pattern our giving because that's biblical. That's what God says. There's a passage that I, that I failed to read earlier. I'm going to read it now. It's in Galatians. So hit, go back to it for me, Sarah. Galatians 6.6 6. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. In other words, you give where you get your blessings. If you've been blessed by the local church, that's where you give. That's the place that God calls us to give. Why does He tell us to do it? He tells us to do it because He Himself is a giving God. And He wants us to exhibit His character to the world around us. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says this, he says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If you, if you were to say to me, Pastor Josh, for whatever circumstance, maybe it's organ donation or something like that. Pastor Josh, I want you to give me your son. I need your son. Give, give him to me. I'd say, no. Go jump off a bridge. That's what I would say. That's my son. But if for some crazy reason, I believe that your life was valuable enough, I valued you enough that I would give you my son. And you could have him. You say, well, can I have his sunglasses and his coat too? His brand new blue jean jacket that he just bought yesterday that looks really good on him? You say, well, you, you have my son. What are, what are his clothes? Take his clothes too. If I were willing to do that, which I'm not. But God was willing to give His one and only Son for you and me so that we might be saved. How is He going to hold anything else back? There's nothing else to hold back. If He gave us what was most precious and most valuable, will He not take care of your needs for tomorrow? Absolutely. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Our God loves you so much that He sent His only Son to die for your sins. 
your sins and my sins. Jesus took them. He was nailed to the cross. He absorbed the wrath of God for you and me. But because He is God, He didn't stay dead. He proved that He is God by raising from the dead. Rising from the dead. And what he, ought, what he calls you to do and what He wants you to do first and foremost, before any of this talk about tithing, before any of this talk about giving, He wants you to give your heart to Him in faith. Asking Him to save you and forgive you of your sin. And if you've never done that before, that's the first step in developing a pattern of giving. That you give your heart to Him. So I want, I want you with your head bowed and your eyes closed that if you would ask the Lord Jesus to save you today, confess Him as your Lord, your Master, that you would just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit to you that I am a sinner. I've done things that I know are wrong. I failed to do the things that I know are right and I deserve the penalty for my sin. But Jesus, I believe that you took my place on the cross. That you died for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. A sinner. And Jesus, I know that you are Lord. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. You can have all of me. Everything I have is yours, Lord Jesus. I want to spend the rest of my life loving you and serving you. Thank you for saving me. You say that with clarity right now if you've prayed this prayer. Say, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Right now, we're going to have our invitation. This is your opportunity that if you have asked Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, that you would come and you would share that with us. It's not meant to be held in. It's meant to be shared as a testimony, as a witness for what the, what the good thing that God has done in your life is. And I, I pray that you would be faithful to do that. Not just now, but you do it forever. And if you're looking for a church home, a church family to be a part of, Myrtle Grove Baptist Church welcomes you. We love you. We want you to serve here with us. And so we welcome you to come now during our invitation. And if you need prayer, we'll, we'll pray with you. We have altar counselors that are coming forward. And so they're going to come now. You come and join them and pray. Let's have our time of invitation. Don't to Jesus I surrender
announcements. Uh, one Wednesday, our uh, Wednesday meal, our menu wasn't on there for this Wednesday, but we're going to be having chicken parm. Uh, so if you like chicken parm, come and get you some. Um, on top of that, Saturday, uh, we have our family-wide, okay, this is not just a children's thing, our family and church-wide fall festival. Um, I'm super excited about it. Uh, I hope you're excited about it. Uh, we have a lot of different places where you can volunteer and help out with that. Uh, we're going to be having a cake baking competition. We're going to have a chili cook-off. Uh, there's going to be an axe-throwing trailer. So if you weren't able to come and throw axes with the young adults, uh, you, get your, you get your shot on Saturday. Um, so come do that. We're going to have a car show. Uh, we have a bunch of different spots where you can volunteer and help out with that. Um, so if you would like to, come see me. Uh, if you have kiddos over there that you need to go pick up, you can talk to Miss Carol Sandy over there, or you can call the church office anytime this week, and we'll let you know where we need your help uh, and what uh, we, can, we can use from you. All right, so the sign-ups for the cake competition and the chili cook-off are going to be right out there in the foyer. Be sure you get signed up for that. With that being said, let me pray, and we'll get out of here. God, we love you. We praise you, and God, I pray that right now for each and every one of us that we leave here and the first thing we do when we get home um, is pray about what it is that we need to be given. God, if it's more that, that we trust you with giving more, God, if it's whatever it is that we have to offer up to you at your altar, God, so, so that we can do more for your, not just your kingdom but also your church, God, I pray that you give us the confidence, God, Show, show us that our, our faith calls us to do way more each and every day. God, I thank you so much for just the opportunity, God, the ability to be able to come here and to worship and praise your name and give uh, you just a tiny bit of the faith that you, or, or the, the glory that you deserve, God. God, we know you deserve so much more. Thank you for our church family being able to worship here together this morning. Guide us, direct us throughout this week so that we can glorify you in your heavenly name. Amen.